And what's up? Welcome back in a Wednesday episode of GC Live. You see him right there. That's Chris Clark, my partner in crime. He is back. Um, Chris, I've, I've been so just like missing the things we make fun of you for. I, I, I wanted to come right in with the, Chris, you've been in the sun. Um, Let's do it. Hot take. But th there is no sun outside, man. It, it is raining. Um, nasty day in Columbia, South Carolina today. I do hope wherever you're catching the show, that you got a little bit better weather than we got going on right here in Columbia. And I hope we're going to make it through the stream, Chris. I know you were having some issues at first. Now I'm when I'm getting that alert right now that says, hey, your, your connection is possibly not quite what it needs to be. So we are going to um, put our hands together. We're going to hope and pray that we get through this thing evenly and without many interruptions i think i think the weather sometimes does mess with my internet connection but chris is back as y'all see um glad to have you back man we're gonna talk obviously we gotta talk spring football right you and i were both out there practice yesterday um but before we dive into it man how we doing everything's good man and even without the sun i do notice i am still a little red so the the season the weather does not really matter i can be red in all occasions but it's great to be back. I already see, already see a lot of our friends hopping in here. Gamecock, Ryan, Kyle, Daniel, what's up, guys? Good to be back here. And yeah, man, I, I was super happy to get out to football spring practice yesterday. Um, didn't see a ton, right? But we did get what six sessions, so that was pretty good. And a lot going on, man. A lot going on this week, whether it's recruiting or Gamecock football, and of course. A basketball coaching search. Yeah, a lot happened, man, when, when you were uh, focusing on the Garnet Trust side of things. And, uh, well, you, you know, you, you're back at the perfect time. As you said, I mean, literally while I was doing the show with Kendall on Monday, um, not only did the Freddie Freeman news hit, but then the Frank Martin news hits. And um, South Carolina's first men's basketball coaching search now in over a decade. So um, we'll, of course uh, – We've been working on that. I'm hoping that uh, we'll have something to put out on Gamecock Central here, um, you know, fairly soon. But, uh, Chris, before we get any further, got to tell everybody about our buddy, Clint Hammond. He is the presenting sponsor here. By the way, I've added a sponsor while you were going, Chris. So we're going to talk about um, – it, it is tax time, so we're going to talk about that in a little bit as well. But our our steady guiding force of GC Live, long time, long term – sponsor uh clint got the long-term deal that freddie freeman did not uh here on gc live clinthammond.com 803-771-6933 not only outstanding at what he does but just an outstanding dude as well and a a, a great consistent supporter of gc live which i can't tell you how much we appreciate there is clint's smiling face right there 71597 is the nmls number and if you're in the market for a new home, give Clint a shout. He'll help walk you through that mortgage process and make it just seamless for you. Uh, speaking of seamless, Gamecocks, um, a, a perfect day one, I would say, yesterday, Chris, just in that, aren't they all? Like, if, if the weather's good and you're out there, the energy is good, there's usually not much, um, th there's not much that can go wrong in that first 20 minutes or 30 minutes that we're out there. So, so far, so good, but I, I got to start, and I'm sure you'll probably start with, with Spencer Rattler. So that, that's what everybody wants to hear about. That's what half of our stories on Gamecock Central were centered around, you know, on, on uh, Tuesday when practice kicked off. But, Chris, I'll turn it to you, man. Your initial thoughts on Spencer Rattler, seeing him out there in, in uniform for the first time and just seeing him in person for the first time. Yeah, I mean, it is different, right, because – you know, knew who Spencer Rattler was in high school, followed him, followed his recruiting a little bit. Not that South Carolina was ever involved at that point with him being a guy who was at the time the number one prospect at his position out of high school in the 2019 class and being from Arizona. And South Carolina just really wasn't involved, right? But followed him there. Obviously, he hit the radar very early. And then, you know, getting to Oklahoma and just watching his career there, obviously, he's one of the most well known college football players and probably just collegiate athletes in general in the country. So from that standpoint, Wes, it was a little bit kind of crazy, right? You just 
to see Spencer Rattler in a Gamecock uniform. I mean, we, we knew it was going to happen. We've known that he was going to be on campus, has been on campus. We've seen pictures of him on campus. But just seeing him on the field was was really pretty interesting and pretty cool. And to me, here's what stood out, man. We Look, a lot of special teams work and drill work, probably, what, four out of the six periods we saw. But we did get a chance to see him throw the football um, very close to us. We were all kind of on one of the end zone lines on one of the practice fields is where the media has to, has to stand. And they did kind of some red zone pass skeleton drills, just a receiver on air running different routes and working on timing and working on, you know, where exactly you want to run and where exactly the ball needs to be placed. And I mean, this is going to sound as cliche as it gets, but the ball looks different when Spencer throws it. And it's very, it's really neat to see in person, not only because of how impressive his arm is, but he's not a huge guy. Like this isn't Josh Allen from the Buffalo Bills. It's not Matthew Stafford when he used to play for Georgia. This is a guy that's not all that huge. Yet when he throws the ball, he can flick it. It's got touch and accuracy when he needs. He's got velocity when he needs. Um, he, he's just really got something special. And, you know, Marcus Satterfield talked about that today in terms of the arm talent. We saw that just in the early going in person in spring practice. And it's something that, Wes, I know we both heard from some sources that we spoke with kind of leading up to spring practice was just since he's got on campus, you can tell, wow, this guy really has a lot of natural ability. Yeah, arm talent is like that cliched um, phrase, but um, it, it's off the charts here. And, you know, I, I think, man, just the, the – as Kyle's pointing out right there, the, the release, like I think to to generate the power he does – like you said, with his size and with the quickness of his release. Um, it, it is it's pretty fun just to watch, man. And just watching, you know, there, there's actually a clip, and you can go watch it. Um, Kendall Smith was out there, and, and you got several clips of him on our YouTube page. And, you know, he, he was kind of work, even though they were against air, he was working on making some throws on the run. Kind of making those off-platform, off-schedule throws, which I guess in this case, they were scheduling the off-platform throws like they were they were working on them. But that's always been a huge part of his game, man. And you look at his ability to play off schedule and make some plays down the field. But just seeing it, there was a throw to Jaheim Bell in the back of the end zone where Spencer like rolled to the opposite direction of his, you know, to, to the left side basically as a right-handed thrower and um threw on the run and, and just uh he, he makes it look easy, man. And I, I thought Kind of telling that even though we didn't see 11 on 11s, he was out there working with the first group. I, I mean, that's kind of that, – that's what you would – like, I think that's kind of the expectation. He's come in, obviously, um, you know, to be the starter. And you look uh, – Satterfield was asked today, Chris, how, you know, how long could this thing go as far as naming a starter? And he said, he said it will be soon. So, you know, I, I think you can anticipate – and, and as much as we've given credit to Luke Doty and we'll continue to give credit and Satterfield gave credit to Luke Doty, I still personally believe that Luke Doty has a great future in this program. And I think this this season could be a huge positive for Luke Doty in the long run. I don't think that's spin to say that. Like, I think this could be a huge positive for Luke Doty in the long run. But uh, – you, you read through the line, you know, read between the lines there a little bit with Satterfield saying it won't be long, you know, with, with Rattler taking the first reps. I mean, Doty's not even 100% at this point. I would imagine here fairly quickly adding all those things together, Chris, that they're going to go ahead and and kind of just make that an announcement for Rattler, I would think. Yeah, and, you know, you and I are – I'm not going to use the word like conservative, but the way that we try to report things, right, is – we will issue opinions or we'll give thoughts on what we think is going to happen on something. When we know it's happened or happening, we will report it. But I, I will actually kind of step outside of that. Spencer Rattler is going to be the starter. I mean, it's just, there's just no doubt about it and you can piece it together. And it's also, I mean, just, just some things that kind of we, we've heard and you can observe the evidence of that, right? It's everything that you just laid out the first team reps, what Satterfield's saying. To go back to Doty, I totally agree with you. I was having that conversation with somebody uh, this week, actually, where 
you know, it's okay for a guy to come in and play early. It's okay for a guy to sit. And it's not even that Luke Doty isn't ready, quote unquote, but look at kind of his, how he's been thrown into things at South Carolina during his career. You know, you think back to the 2020 season, he's a true freshman. He's bounced back and forth between receiver and quarterback. And then, hey, why don't you go in this half of the game and and try to play? And then next, oh, now it's your first start, right? Uh, you think the 2021, obviously, he has the injury. And then he comes back, he's playing injured, right, with an offense that is struggling. So he's never had that stable situation to come through. He's never, he's never been able to really go through an entire – off season and season at number one as a quarterback and number two healthy, both of those things at the same time. And so this season could allow him to do that and sitting behind, you know, Spencer Rattler and learning from him. Those guys have a really great rapport, Wes, like Spencer's talked about it. Luke's talked about, it. I know, you know, you, you, we've talked with both of those guys. Spencer mentioned it in his press conference. Luke mentioned it to you in a Garnet trust interview, how close they've gotten and how much they lean on each other. I saw that on the field yesterday. They're talking a lot. They're joking. They're helping each other. And so I think it's a great situation for Luke. And obviously it's a great situation for Spencer Rattler as well. You know, I think um, this, and remember talking about it, man, but it's, it's not really like, it's not coach speak when he says this could have been, I would dare say an awkward situation. Like this could have been, this could have been weird. And we we've seen, We've seen it other places. Shoot, we we actually saw it. I don't even have to say other places, Chris. We've seen it in South Carolina. Um, and, and that's no disrespect at all to Jason Brown because Jason Brown has one year of eligibility left. When he saw Spencer Rattler was coming in, he decided, um, you know, I, I'm gonna I've got a better chance to play somewhere else. And, you know, I'm I'm gonna go to Virginia Tech and and prop, you know, maybe maybe found a better situation for himself. And there's nothing wrong with that at all. But um, when Doty made the decision to stay, which I don't really even think from everything I've heard was much of a like true discussion. I, I think this is just where he wants to be. Um, he also, you know, made the decision to be to be all in on it. And when when Satterfield says stuff like there's not a better kid and not a better leader on this team than Luke Doty, um, I, that's not exaggerating as far as what he means to this team, in my opinion, man. We've heard too many times just how well he carries himself. And, um, you know, to your point, Luke's not a guy that had played a ton of quarterback even coming into his college career. He was injured his senior year. Um, he did the team first thing and played receiver as a sophomore in high school as well. So, you know, spending some time, continuing to engulf himself in this system, spending some time with Rattler, behind Rattler, you know, pushing Rattler. All those things could be really good for, for Luke Doty in the long run. And I, I think just the way he carries himself is an example for, um, you know, for what Beamer wants in this program. Um, you know, you and I had the chance to sit down with Beamer fairly recently and, you know, he mentioned that this is kind of the example. This is what we this is how we want our guys in this program to carry themselves. And I'll I'll just I'll give a lot of credit to the new guys, to all the transfers, you know, dispenser plus all the other guys, and the guys who who have been here welcoming the new guys into the program. It does sound cliche, but I think we've seen evidence that the guys have just sort of they've looked around and been like, hey, these new guys are coming into work. And that that's the key to it all. If the new guy comes in and acts like he's better than the program, you're going to have issues. If the new guy comes in, puts his head down and goes to work. I think that's the great um, connection, right? You don't care where a guy's from. You don't care what he's really about. Um, you know, you don't care his background. You care. Does he work? And I think that's been the common denominator with these incoming transfers from everything we have heard, Chris. Yeah, it is. And, um, you know, Devonnie Reed, you know, at safety is a guy that I had heard some good things about. And Shane Beamer, I recall uh, during his Tuesday press conference after practice, number one, um, you know, shouted out Devonnie Reed as a guy that 
um, you know, has really done a good job in terms of leadership. Jalen Foster was just, you know, a huge loss, not only for his production, right, but just for his vocal ability. He, he was such a linchpin for that secondary last year, and that's why we went into last season really, really, you know, talking about how much worry there is, was in that secondary, exited the season saying, gosh, how did they play that well, that solidly? Jalen Foster was a big reason for that, not only his production, but his leadership. And so Devonnie Reed as a transfer from Central Michigan has been able to help with that. Uh, Clayton White today talked about Terrell Dawkins, NC State transfer, how well, you know, he's carried himself. But certainly Spencer is a guy that, I mean, we've talked about this before, Wes, the professional type approach that he takes. He got to South Carolina and he was kind of on a mission, right? When he was going through the recruiting process, as we've said, the transfer recruiting process is often so much different than the high school recruiting process. Um, we talked about that with Beamer. Spencer's taught with us about it. You're just looking for different things sometimes. You're looking for trust. You're looking for opportunity. Spencer, with what he went through at Oklahoma, looked around, and he saw a situation at South Carolina where he saw opportunity, and he saw a, a you know comfort level with Shane Beamer. And same thing with South Carolina and Spencer. Beamer – knew Rattler. He knew what he could do, knew what he was about. And so everything since the day that Spencer committed to South Carolina has been a business-like approach. So Rattler's not showing up, talking big or flaunting anything. He's just come out and he has a track record and he has a name and he's just come out and worked consistently. Um, and, and I think that's really shown with how people view him in the program and, and just what we saw kind of a glimpse of yesterday. All right, so let's get past the quarterbacks, Chris. Um, we, I'll go ahead and say the caveat of, hey, it was 30 minutes in, no pads, helmets, blah, 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 blah. People don't want to hear that. People don't care. They want to hear, what did we see? And um, we, we've gotten seven out of the way, right? We got Rattler out of the way. That's the first thing everybody wants to know about. Who's next? What, what or who caught your eye about uh, – just the, the entire thing. You can take in any direction you want. Who or what caught your eye? So two more things that that caught my eye. You know, just watching Jaheim Bell run around again. Um, we've seen what he can do on the field. Um, but just watching, you know, Spencer Rattler connect with him on some on some throws again against air. They're just past skeleton down in the red zone, working on some different route combinations. But Jaheim Bell is just a guy that South Carolina has to find a way to to unlock cheat code that he is this year on a more consistent basis and just just when, when you can see him you know on film or watching a game on tv even watching a game in the stadium but when you're down there ground level just watching him run around it really hits home you know how much of an athletic kind of outlier and freak that he is um the other guy Wes I was really curious to get a look at Antoine Wells because he's a newcomer and he plays a position of great need for South Carolina Obviously, Josh Van comes back. You've got Jaheim. Those things are great. But I was curious to get a look at Antoine Wells. A little bit bigger, I think, in terms of frame or maybe perceived weight. A little bit bigger than I thought he would be even. But I thought he moved around quite well and showed some really quick route running ability in and out of his breaks. So he's obviously a key player this year, Antoine Juice Wells Jr. for the Gamecocks. And, you know, we got a chance to see him pretty up close on one of those last drills in practice Tuesday. Yeah, and Chris, I I heard, um, you know, again, we didn't get to see a, a bunch of it, uh, but we both, I think, were kind of reaching out, trying to find some folks who maybe saw more practice than we did. And um, I heard he had a good day. Like, he, he had a good overall day, made some plays. That, that's what you wanted to see, obviously, from him. Didn't look like he was working with the first group, at least in the portion of practice we watched, um, starting – I don't know if to say starting, but first team receivers, day one, Josh Van, the carry on joiner, and then Xavier Leggett at that other outside spot. But I would imagine Wells is gonna Wells is gonna make a push, man. Like that, that's I don't want to say it's a given. Like may, maybe we're maybe I'm getting a little too far ahead of myself, but based on what I saw from the highlights of him at JMU, based on what we just witnessed in a very short period of time yesterday based on what I heard South Carolina felt about him and just some of that early feedback. 
this guy is going to make an impact for, for South Carolina. And I'd imagine starts making a push for a um, that that first maybe first team spot um, out there, you know, alongside right now, probably Van and Joyner. Um, I think Amari and Brown can push Joyner in, in the slot as well. Um, just feels like do you do you remember how many how many receiver conversations we had um, for the last two years, man? Yes. I it, it really, <laughs> you remember how old that got? Like every week, every day. Yeah, it, it, it was it was constant, and we're we're still going to be discussing the receivers, but I, I think it's going to be in a much more positive potential light because now you know, but Bell is apparently a wide back now, uh, according to Satterfield. So he's not even really a tight end. I think they're kind of all in on he's like a slot, move you around, put him in, put him in the backfield. Um, matter of fact, as Satterfield was walking off the, the podium today, somebody threw out the idea of, um, are, are you going to give Bell the football 10 times, like in the running game? And Satterfield was like, absolutely. You know, so, you know, they're, they're, I think they're, they realize that, um, it, it took, it took a little bit of time to like figure out exactly how to structure it to get him the ball as much as you need to. But when they did, he simply made plays. So you, you, you take what you have in bell getting van back the addition of Stogner as well. Who's not there for the spring. I think he helps in the passing game too, as a true inline tight end. And then whoever else it is, man, it, you know, is it, is it Wells on the outside? Does Leggett, you know, finally sort of step into a big role? Amari and Brown, we're going to talk about another potential transfer receiver here in a moment. Um, it just feels like a much better situation, Chris. You know, I think uh, – I'm glad you brought up tight ends, Wes. I, I think tight end, that true position, and so I'm not counting Jaheim Bell in that equation because of how he's going to be used. We don't even need to call him a tight end, wide back, to toy, whatever you want to call him. Um, I think tight end is a position that we're going to go through spring and say it looks a little bit lean, right? But the addition of Stogner is going to be giant. Obviously, he's not participating in spring practice. He's made it clear he's going to be around a ton. What, what did he joke, Wes? It's going to be an unofficial visit every day almost at some points or something like that. Not officially on the team, not officially going through practice, but he's going to be soaking in, absorbing, learning. And this is a guy that is an extremely hard worker. I mentioned professional approach with Spencer Rattler. Same deal with Stogner, his former teammate. He, he approaches things that same way. And he's going to be huge, I think, for this team as, like you said, Wes, you think of that prototypical true tight end, the guy that Nick Muse was for South Carolina, where he can be a blocker for you, he can block on the perimeter, he can block in line, and he can be a pass-catching threat. I think Austin Stogner can be that. The key to all this, I think, just uh, one big picture thought real quick is, like you mentioned, this, the staff finally kind of unlocking and figuring out how to get Bell the ball. There are several guys on this roster that have the skill sets to where if you can do that, and we don't need to relitigate the reasons why that happened, right? We, we did that plenty last year. We're, we're past that. But if you can do that, you have guys like, obviously, you got a trigger man in Rattler. Then you've got Jaheim Bell. You've got your running backs, um, adding Christian Beal Smith, a healthy Marshawn Lloyd, et cetera. Um, and then you've got on Joyner, who can play a niche role for you. You've got a Marion Brown, who in the bowl game, we saw a little bit more of, okay, this is his skill set. This is what he's good at. This is what he should be doing. If they can unlock those things and establish some consistency, find some consistency, it's not like they're lacking for weapons. Are they the most loaded offensive team in the country or even in the conference? No, no, no not in my opinion. But is it a better looking picture this year than going into last season? I think you can make a really good argument for that. Well, man, even remember last year with Josh Van, we, you know, we, we had heard the rumblings, right? But I think we were all, you know, not to be negative, but we were all just waiting to see it happen consistently on the field. Um, 
And I, I don't think Josh would even take offense to that. Like he, he's been open and honest about, uh, you know, his first few years on campus. And, you know, I remember speaking at a, a Gamecock event and they said, who is the leading receiver going to be at the end of the year? And based on everything I had heard, I was sort of between Joyner and Van and didn't really know which direction to take it. And I remember when I when I said Van, a couple of people like almost, not almost, they literally rolled their eyes at me and were like, nah, you know, that's, that's not going to happen. And, um, you know, so I, I think th- this time last year, we were saying, who is the guy who's going to be the best, like the top receiver in this room? Now you have Van with the confidence of a full year under his belt where he was the guy, plus a bell, plus all these other options. And, you know, Van, we, we've talked about it, Chris. He is kind of the the very latest example of you can never quite give up on a guy based on him not doing it as fast as maybe you expected it to, you know, expected him to. So can can I still have this I still have this thought that one day with Leggett, like he's got talent and he's got size, that it's just gonna all click together. He's going to be a dude for South Carolina. So is there still somebody else? You know, we're not talking about EJ Jenkins near as much. Remember last year, there was some EJ Jenkins hype. Now it was, is he a tight end? Is he a receiver? Is he both? Um, That's part of the reason that tight end room is, quote, uh, thin right now, because EJ's at receiver. Eric Shaw is at receiver. Jaheim is at Jaheim Bell roll. So, um, and as you said, Stog is not there, and Muse has graduated. Muse has graduated. So I, I think um, it's just it's just an overall much better spot, man. And they're going to have to, they being Marcus Satterfield and the coaches, are going to have to figure out how to make it all fit together and find a way to get the ball to all these guys. And um, that's not even to mention this, what I think is going to be a really fun position battle at running back. Um, Beamer's. Quote, I believe on Lloyd was he's a man on a mission. Um, he took the first rep we saw, but I can't help but think Christian Bill Smith is going to have his say in this thing before it's over, man. Well, Christian Bill Smith certainly used to taking carries or, or splitting carries, rather. Obviously, taking carries, he's a running back. Used to splitting carries with, with his time at Wake Forest and was extremely effective doing so. And look, I mean, you know, anybody who's followed South Carolina as a fan or covered South Carolina knows it's typically, and, and, and this isn't like native to South Carolina or unique to South Carolina, you're going to get guys banged up at running back. You're going to have some times where, for whatever reason, one back's more effective than another one. So you need multiple guys. And so, obviously, you lose a warrior in Zaquandre White, who was playing very well for South Carolina last season. You lose Kevin Harris, who obviously had some huge games and was very steady. And as the year went along, he seemed to get healthier and and look better and better. You lose both those guys, and those are significant losses. But you do have a guy in Marshawn Lloyd that, again, let's not give up on this guy. A lot of people are looking around going, he's a former five-star. What's the deal? Remember, last season – the Florida game in the middle of the year was the first time that week leading up where he got that knee brace off. And there's some indications that he looks finally fully healthy, right? Ready to go from <clears throat> spring on. And so a uh, very intriguing talent set. Christian Beal Smith, I think, you know, not as big and bulky as Kevin Harris, um, but as a guy that has, I think he can give you a similar running style and that he can he can grind out some yards for you. If you go back and look at what he did at Wake Forest, it's pretty impressive. And obviously there's some others. And Jaheim Bell, as you mentioned earlier, Wes, can get some carries, whether it's as a wing back or line him up in the backfield as a running back. Whatever you do with Jaheim Bell, get the ball in his hands. So there are some options there, and I think there's still some good options at running back. That is, I think, one of the most interesting battles uh, it was last year, and I think it is this year too. And I think it it continues probably into the fall. But I also, Chris, I don't think anybody over there wants it to be or, 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 or let's play seven running backs um, 
It just doesn't work like that, I feel like. It, your guys cannot get comfortable. I think you need you need two that are sort of splitting and then a third for, for a game situation. Right Agreed. now, now if, if a guy goes down, then whoever is fourth, you're still getting them ready in practice. Don't get me wrong, but going into a game, I feel like you got two. You basically have two starters, in my opinion. Then you have like that third guy. If the first two are getting worn down, you throw him in there. But man, they they were rotating guys so much early on last year, and they weren't having offensive success. So I think we forget that little piece about it as well. If you're how are you gonna how are you gonna find a rhythm if you're rotating four backs and you're going three and out? You know, so <laughs> it's just not gonna happen. Well, and dude, the other I mean. I didn't even mention in my little monologue there about running backs. Didn't you mentioned Juju McDowell, you know, I mean, kind of now he, because of his size and his skill set, he's a guy that's a little bit different than say a Christian Beal Smith or even Marshawn Lloyd. You know, he's different than those guys, but where does he fit into that? Like, is he someone that you feel good about being, you know, I think if you think of Juju McDowell as your starter, that probably means he's out there for the first play or the first series of a game because you've got some stuff for him. Is he going to carry the ball 25 times? I don't think so, right? But he does have that really unique skill set, and there were some times where you looked around and you said, man, Juju McDowell looks like the best back on the roster right now um, in spots last season. So certainly a lot of guys, and, and all these guys are different, and can do different things for you. So it will be fascinating to see how it plays out. And no doubt, like you said, if South Carolina can be running 75, 80 plays a game as opposed to 50, then we're going to see more production, you know, from all of these guys, more snaps for all of them. Yeah, and then everybody's happy. But uh, but we shall see, man. Uh, interesting note here. I, I wanted to bring this up, but I'm, gra- I'm glad that Travis did. Um, only 14 of the sacks last year were actually credited directly to the offensive line. So that's something I want to unpack for a second. But also um, also I want to talk a little bit of recruiting. There were some guys on campus yesterday and a big visitor. Uh, we reported on Gamecock Central earlier this afternoon. A big visitor set for uh, early next week. But first, Chris, uh, I got to tell you about our newest sponsor, man. Have you done your taxes yet, Chris? Not yet. It is looming and lingering like a dark cloud in yes. Columbia. Um, that means you probably have a bit of uh, taxiety, Chris, uh, which is a thing. I didn't know it was a thing. I didn't know there was a word for it, but I get it. I understand what it is now. Um, it is that it's that looming feeling that you just described. Um, so if you're a little bit worried, you're just kind of like, oh, God, I got to do my taxes. Um, our friend Larry, who is actually – a loyal listener and watcher here of GC Live reached out to me, said, hey, guys, I want to do something with the show. Um, so I'm hoping everybody watching and listening will reward Larry. Give him a call, 803-462-5576. This is the Liberty Tax Team. Here in the Midlands, they actually have multiple um, locations here. Uh, the tax team at Liberty Tax it has locations in Irmo, Lexington, and a new one in Columbia. Uh, the Lexington one is 1123 South Lake Drive. Uh, the Irmo one is 7467 St. Andrews Road. And then there's a new location at 551 St. Andrews Road, Columbia. That is by the Harbor Freight and KJ's Grocer next to Goodwill. Uh, locally owned and operated. They have virtual income tax prep, if that is your thing. They, of course, have in-person tax prep. And this time of year, Chris, they're actually open late and on the weekends as well. So. Um, Throughout the rest of the show, you will see the little scroll going at the bottom of the screen. And I uh, definitely want to encourage everybody to use the tax team there with Liberty Tax to do your taxes because it is tax time. Um, let, let's talk a little recruiting, Chris. We reported earlier today, um, Corey Rucker, the Arkansas State wide receiver, who we had previously told people was probably going to visit, was planning to visit South Carolina at some point. That is now locked in. Uh, March 21st, um, that's next Monday, he will be taking what he says is an official visit to South Carolina. And, um, man, th- this, as much as we were just talking about how things are looking up at receiver, 
you add this guy to the mix. I, I don't know how much of his film you've watched yet, man, but pretty impressive kid. Can get open, great after the catch, great ball skills. Probably comes right in and starts if South Carolina can land him and has shown really immediate interest in South Carolina ever since they offered. I think this is a big opportunity. I want. I don't want to say they're 100% the favorite yet, but I think South Carolina should have some cautious optimism uh, about adding this kid going in, and it, it would be a big get for the receiving court. Yeah, and uh, some other schools after him. I mean, Auburn, Ole Miss, Virginia Tech, Duke. Uh, he, he's continued, you know, picking up offers since he entered the portal, which was only – was I was less than two weeks ago, right, Wes? So, um, had a really good season. I think second team all Sun Belt. Kind of an undervalued recruit out of high school. He's a kid from Mississippi, um, but really just made an immediate impact at Arkansas State, and you're exactly right. When you kind of turn on the film and you look at the production, he's been very productive. And I think when, when you look at, you know, what Josh Van did last year at South Carolina and finally upping his production as a Gamecock, when you look at Antoine Wells, super, super productive at his level, he's stepping up. You know, Corey Rucker would be stepping up from the Sun Belt to the SEC. But when you have guys with a track record of success wherever they are, that's someone you can probably feel pretty good about getting. And so Rucker, you know, has been a priority for the staff, as, you, as you've reported, Wes. Ever since he entered the portal, it was clear that they were going to go pretty hard uh, for him. And this is going to be, I think, their first step towards potentially, we don't know, you know, for sure, but potentially being able to secure him. It'd be a good get. We know Shane Beamer and his recruiting staff have kept deliberately some flexibility, you know, going forward in case somebody else did enter the portal that they wanted to chase a receiver entering late. That's exactly what has happened now with Rucker. Yeah, and man, there there will be more guys to hit the portal after the spring as well. But we'll see. I the more dude, the more I think about it, the more if if it was it was my roster, I'd try to add a receiver, which obviously they are. I wonder if they don't add another safety, man. I mean, I, I know I know Reed is probably gonna start, but I, I thought it was interesting today that Clayton White said, Hey, RJ Roger would make an excellent nickelback. That's a spot he's – now, he's played that role we've seen at, at times in his career. He played, I want to say, pretty much all safety, if I remember correct, last year, man. But you can't you can't really move RJ to nickel at this point because there's no depth behind him at safety. So, I mean, to me, that's a – if the right guy is out there, that's a high consideration. Unless Anthony Rose is just – Day one starter type talent. Um, very talented kid now. Don't get me wrong. Like, I, I think we both love his upside. But um, I, I don't know, man. I, I think another safety, and that's nothing we've been told at all. It just, that might be something to take a look at. Oh, totally agree. And and I'm glad you brought that up. I wanted to make sure that we fit that into the show is when you look at, you've talked some, talked about some things that you feel good about or better about relative to last spring or last season on this team. And there are some things that you, you know, as a Gamecock fan or as a media member kind of covering the team and formulating an opinion, there's concern, I think, at that safety spot. Because, again, you lose Foster. That's a big loss. You lose Jalen Dickerson, Wes, who's now Coach Dickerson, milling around there on the sidelines helping the team. Um, he's someone that played a part at times last year, a part during the course of his career, not as much as anybody hoped because of the unfortunate injuries that he uh, seemed to – he just couldn't shake that injury bug. But he did play a role. He was available at some points, uh, especially last season. So you, you lose those guys. You don't have them anymore. Reed, you can count on. It, it was pretty easy to see when Reed – decided to transfer to South Carolina from Central Michigan, you could kind of point to him and say, that guy's probably going to start. Like, it would be a surprise if he didn't. The only other guy that you can look at and say that's probably a starter is exactly like you said, R.J. Roderick. So, look, you lose at nickel. David Spalding's out right now. You lose Carlin Splatel. Those guys kind of platoon last season. So now you're kind of left with, okay, you've got Spalding when he comes back. Who else? Can somebody overtake him? Or who's just your second guy there, if needed, or even if you platoon guys, you really can't point to anybody. So Cam Smith's taking some roles there, some reps there, but you need him at corner. 
RJ Roderick, as you said, you could play him at nickel. He's needed at safety. So there is certainly a void there at nickel and at safety that South Carolina is going to have to, you know, they're going to have to figure that situation out before September. Yeah, they are, man. And, and you can't, you can't count on just two guys at safety. Um, you, you don't, even if they're all, even if you're just lucky and they all stay healthy, it's still not ideal. We've seen Carolina have to just play guys literally the entire game in the secondary at times in the past. You can do it if you have to, but then the second a guy gets banged up, um, what what do you do there? You know, and I, I think we've seen Clayton White last year said he did not want to be in that position of just playing his starters every single rep, but he got kind of forced into it at times at certain positions. So linebacker last year, the starters, you know, they didn't play every rep, but there was a time during the season where, where they were playing most reps and there were guys in the secondary playing most reps. So I I think that's something you got to try to find some options either internally this year or this spring, I should say, or if you have to hit the portal, find another guy. Um, you know, we'll, we'll see if, if they do that. Brandon says linebacker. I, as far as like maybe portal additions is what he's asking about. For me, it would have to be an absolute difference maker. You know, I don't I don't think linebacker is that spot where I would go out and add just to add. Like, I don't think I'd add a depth guy there. I think they've got enough kids on campus, enough guys who could step in at this point in their career. You you hope that a Debo Williams is coming along, that a Mokab is coming along, Stone Blanton gets added to the mix in the summer. Um, now, if a three-year – if a guy with three years left that's a freak of nature, I'm not telling him no. Um, but otherwise, I don't, I, I think as we've talked about it, safety may be Chris, the greatest concern on, on this entire team. I think you could make that argument. You can make that argument. Um, and, and that's, it's kind of the weird thing, Wes, told somebody this yesterday, kind of talking about offense, defense, special team, special teams. You got to think about Parker White, you know, mm -hmm. he, he's not you know as much as we all fully expect him to trot out for year 11 he's not walking through the door i walking through the door i don't think i don't think but you know you, you look at offense and like there's been a lot of positive talk about the offense and there are reasons for that is there still going to be a prove it element to it yes nobody's saying otherwise but you it is fair to assess you know the personnel changes and differences but when you look at defense that's where you can go. You know, South Carolina took a defense with very low expectations last year, and they cobbled it together. Did they struggle sometimes? Yes. But they played well overall. They exceeded expectations. Well, now you lose J.J. and Ibarre and Foster and Jabari Ellis and some of these guys. You have these depth issues at safety and nickel. There's a good argument to be made. There's more concerns on defense, you know, this year, which is which is kind of interesting. Yeah, Ben uh, Benjamin DeRosa asking – Anthony Rose or Peyton Williams, how much time will they see as freshmen? Um, of the two, I think Rose is the guy that just has a has a shot. Just athletically, he looks like someone who's kind of far along, like he he's developed athletically. Um, we'll we'll see how quickly he picks everything up. That's always the question with freshmen, right? How quickly do they pick it up? How quickly do they get settled? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Rose has got to be the one they're hoping, in my opinion. Then, you know, you, you get some other guys coming in later on in, in the summer that I think are going to have a, a chance as well, um, you know, to, to step in and, and help this football team. So we'll see where they slot all those guys. Um, not necessarily the perfect world to be counting on some freshmen to come in and provide depth, but they will um, – they'll do what they have to do. They're, I mean, Chris, I remember looking at cornerback last year and everybody thought uh, – myself included, that was a massive concern. Now you go in, you got your starters, right? Like you have Darius Rush, you have Cam Smith, you have Marcellus Dahl, you have all those guys back. Um, Isaiah Norris played a little bit down the stretch last year, made his debut. So corner, you kind of you kind of feel good about it. I think Darius Rush is taking another step, um, you know, for everything I've seen and heard. So um, there are some spots that are in much better – a much better place. And then there are some spots, like you said, where you, you have concern. 
I was talking and I, I put this in Carolina Confidential today. I was talking to somebody that's been in a lot of practices over the years, and he was talking about how it just looked a little more sharp for a day one than he remembered it looking last fall. You know, when you just look at the fact that it's a it's a new staff, there's a new way of doing things, new schemes all across the board, and you know, there's there's just a greater comfort level, I, I think, but also with the addition of the transfers and a bunch of guys coming back, I think you would argue there's probably a little bit better depth of talent on this team right now as well at a number of positions. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, overall, that's certainly a fair statement. I mean, look at quarterback, for instance, especially, you know, once, uh, you know, Tanner Bailey will arrive this summer and then you've got Bailey and Davis and Spencer Rattler and Doty and Colton Gothier. You've got all those guys. Um, defensive tackle you know feel better there are certain there are certain spots where you look at defensive end safety nickel there are concerns there even relative to last season when they were thin at safety and nickel still right but there are some where you feel better or about equal as i think overall you look at this team and you probably carry a few less questions this spring now the questions that you do have are still very significant pass rush is still a big question losing J.J. and Igbari, who's one of the best in the country. Do they have Birch and Jordan Strong as some guys who are capable? Yes. Um, but, again, th- those depth concerns and some of those key areas that you really need in order to win football games, those, those are still in play. They're still there. No doubt, man. Um, so, fin- final thoughts here, I guess. Um, that That little tidbit about the offensive line, that only 14 sacks – we're on the off, and, and you know what? That's you. You can't, you can't just like erase the other sacks. You know, it, it's because of other teams. And if you try to compare that number, we don't know what the other teams' internal um, analysis told them as far as what the sacks, who you know was responsible for the sacks. So you can't really compare with just that number, but. Um, it was interesting to hear just internally how few of those sacks were, were credited on the offensive line. And I wholly appreciate that they got another Zeb jab in there um, in, in that answer as well. No doubt. Boy, just really just really killing our guys. Uh, but, no, I mean, look, I remember it, it almost reminded me of 2020 because there were a lot of sacks that year too. And, again, the sack number – does not need to be high. Let's start there. Nobody's excusing that number. But when a sack happens in football, everybody says the O-line made that sack happen. It's not always the case. So you made a good point, though. The top team in the country, which I, I don't know, Wes, I don't have it in front of me, the top team in the country last year, how many sacks they gave up. Let's say it's 15, which is a good number. You know, maybe seven was on their O-line. Right, so there's always some type of ratio. And I think even watching the games last season, your first observation is, you know, in addition to the offense in general, your first observation is always there's too many sacks going on. But when you actually look beyond that, there were times where it was obvious, okay, the quarterback held the ball too long there. Or maybe a receiver ran a wrong route here and they weren't on – they had to pull the ball down. Or that back obviously missed a blitzing linebacker. You know, so it's not always as simple as just saying, well, the O-line stinks. Now, was the O-line a strong unit last year? No. And that was not only pass blocking, but run blocking as well. Again, a lot went into that. Um, But it was a fair point, I think, that when you see a sack, it's not always just offensive line, their fault. Um, Tight ends, backs, quarterbacks, all that works in tandem. And all that last year was not nearly good enough um, on the pass protection front. Yeah, and lot, lots of issues on the offense overall that just were not good enough last year. And um, we'll see if they can can put it all together this year. Uh, Chris, we'll be back out there Thursday morning, another open practice. I believe they're slimming us back down. Are, are we? Are they easing us back down? Is it five segments now? I'm not totally sure, but I, I think that's the case. I think, I think they're they're like real, you know, real easing back, back a little bit. Yeah. Um, Man, this has been fun. Glad to have you back. Uh, I think the people are glad to have you back. The numbers are up. And um, 
Hey, so I I don't know. I don't I don't watch like late night TV. I just watch Netflix. So I don't know if this is the late show or the tonight show or Jimmy Fallon or Jimmy whoever else. I think there's a bunch of Jimmys. Um they they do the mean tweets, Chris. So uh to close it out, I, I had to I want to close out this show with a little bit of fun. Um not Chris, not everybody loves us, by the way. So uh I can't believe it. I know, I know. We're not at a hundred percent. Not everybody loves us. And um the people on YouTube like to let us know when they don't like us. So yeah. th- they they all love Kendall though. And Kendall um did a video with me yesterday after practice. And um very first response to Kendall's video with me. <laughs> Good thing Kendall was asking the questions because Wes's quote questions. Each take about 30 minutes of him rambling to get to the point. This video would have been two hours <laughs> instead of two minutes. That's so, awesome. yeah, I'm going to lean into that. Yes, I ramble. Yes, I talk a lot. Um, but also to, what's your name? Saint, I don't know, Saint Sac- Santanaco. Um, Santanico. This is a talk show. So if it's me and Chris, yes, there is a question and I'm probably phrasing a question, but I'm gonna give my opinion as well. Uh, so yeah, I do. I do. I get it. The, the, over, the overall point is Kendall's way better than either of us, and she should be yeah. on the show more. So, and, uh, and I agree. So and fine. so I, I to uh, to even this out, Chris. <laughs> somebody, uh, your yours is less um is less mean in my opinion. They didn't really choose violence, but this was this was actually from this week as well. Um, somebody asked if, uh, if you had, if you were on vacation, like where, where were you? Are you on vacation? And <laughs> someone responded and says, Chris always looks like he is on vacation. Hey, so, you know what? I, I don't even, I take that as a compliment. I, I think that means if I look like I'm on vacation, I'm nice and relaxed. I assume he means red. <laughs> that, I'll, I'll that's what I took. Hey, I hope so, man. I, I, I plan on being in the sun a lot this spring and summer, so I'm good with it. More sunscreen, yes. Yeah, is, that, is that your um, your goal for this year? <laughs> yes, and I do wear sunscreen most of the time. I think you just have a naturally red face, man. I'm a little like, bit I red. Know. I mean, I can't help it, and it is what it is. But but I, I actually I don't even take that as a mean. You got to find another one, Wes. You got to dig something okay. else up. I'm, go look at Twitter. I'm sure there's something on there mean about me. Well, there's there are random people telling you to go get your skin checked uh, because your your red face. Uh, yeah, you remember that? Yeah. There was somebody on Twitter that's not even a Gamecock fan. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He wanted to comment. So Yeah, I, I appreciate the concern. Yeah, high level concern there. Um, <laughs> anyway, I'm sure there's other mean tweets about us. I just, those were the most recent ones. I was like, golly, somebody, I was in a good mood yesterday until I read that. Um, anyway, we'll be back. Uh, I don't know when we'll do another show. Well, I'm sure we'll do another show this week at some point, man. Hit some other observations, and uh, hopefully we have a men's basketball update for you guys soon, that coaching search, because obviously I know y'all want to hear about that. Uh, For Chris, I'm Wes. Also, by the way, if you're not a Gamecock Center subscriber, here I go rambling again, right? If you're not a subscriber, for spring deal, four months for $10. So that's the promotion we have going right now. Go check it out, top of the page, GamecockCentral.com. Four months for 10 bucks. That'll get you all through spring, all of our spring football coverage, women's basketball, race for a, a, a national title coverage, and then, of course, men's basketball, first coaching search in over a decade. For Chris, I'm Wes. We'll see you soon.